prayer. You know, I find there are certain questions that over the years I've noticed that uh, brothers and sisters are asking me about different things and there are certain questions that I regularly receive and one of them is about Salatul Witta. And when I was younger I used to just give an answer. Now I really try to direct people toward the source so they can read it for themselves and get it and you know get more of it and understand it. So right here in uh, the Sahih Sitha, the six authenticated uh, collections of uh, the Ahadith, the most prominent of which is Sahih Bukhari and then secondarily Sahih Muslim. Uh, we have right here uh, a chapter of the Hadith entitled Abwabul Witta, the chapters of Witta. And right at the beginning, Imam Bukhari, he defines Witta prayer as a prayer of an odd number of rakahs offered after the Isha prayer or after the Tahajjah, and it is to be offered before Fajr. Right? Everybody got that. That's what Witta is. It's an odd numbered prayer. The one rakah, three rakahs, and the Witta prayer is offered after Salatul Isha or after the uh, Tahajjah prayer, but before Fajr. That's what Witta is. So now here's a, um, a hadith narrated by Ibn Umar, right? Allah, one, who said, once a person asked the Messenger of Allah about what they call here Salatul Layl. Salatul Layl is Qiyamul Layl. Qiyamul Layl is Tahajjah. So somebody went to the Prophet and they asked him about Qiyamul Layl. And the Messenger of Allah replied, Qiyamul Layl is offered as two rakahs followed by two rakahs and so forth. And if anyone is afraid of the approaching dawn, afraid of Salat al-Fajr, he should pray one rakah, and this will be a witter for all the rakah which he has prayed before. And Nafi told that Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anh used to say the tasneem between the first two rakahs and the third odd one in the witter prayer when he wanted to attend to a certain matter. Second hadith says, narrated by Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anh. He says, once I spent the night in the home of Maimuna. Maimuna, radiallahu anh, was uh, Ibn Abbas's aunt. So he said, once he, he uh, and, and she was uh, one of the wives of the prophets. So, in other words, so sometimes he would spend the night in the prophet's house with his wife, Mahmuda, who was his aunt. And he says, uh, I slept across the bed and the messenger of Allah and his wife slept lengthwise. Now, again, I have to translate this culture. You know, they didn't have beds like a bed we have. You know, bedding meant bedding spread out on the floor. Okay, you know, a, a mat, maybe a straw mat, a blanket, you know, something like that. So he's, uh, he's pointing out, he said, well, they used to sleep this way, you know, and I used to sleep that way. This way, this way he's saying. So he said, uh, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, slept until midnight or so, and he woke up rubbing his face, and he recited ten verses from Surah Ali Imran. Then the Messenger of Allah went towards a leather skin, meaning a water skin, and he performed wudu in the most perfect way. And then he stood for the Salah. I did the same and stood behind him. And the Prophet put his right hand on my head, twisted my ear, and then prayed two rakahs five times, and then ended his prayer with wit. In other words, the Prophet stood up and started praying, and Ibn Abbas came up beside him. So rather than break the Salah, the Prophet just put his hand, you know, and let him know, listen, we're going to be making Tasneem like this here. So then the Prophet prayed five, 
five uh, uh, sets of two rock cards each. Five sets of two rock cards each. And then he ended his salah with winter. He laid down until the Muazzin came, and, and you know, meaning until the Adhan was called for Salat al Fajr. And then he stood up and he offered two rakahs, and then went out and offered the Fajr prayer. Again, it was the habit and the message of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to pray his Sunnahs and his Nawafils at home, and he would go to the Masjid to, uh, to pray the Fajr. Okay? So here's a here's a uh, a um, example of one of the ways that the Prophet Ali Salam uh, made which he would pray in this case five rakahs to hajjah I mean five sets of two rakahs meaning ten all together to hajjah and then one witcher which uh, made eleven all together. Then lastly. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu an narrated that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Qiyamu layl, salatu layl, is often as two rakahs followed by two and so on. And if you want to finish it, pray only one rakah which will be witter for all the previous rakah. And then Al Qasim said, since we reached the age of pu puberty, we have seen some people offer a three rakah prayer as winter, and all that is permissible. I hope that there will be no harm in it. Okay, so I, you know, I cite that. There are more hadith. You, you can look it up. You know. So my point here is, I'm just pointing to number one, salatul winter, as part of the sunnah of uh, nighttime frame. You know, again, there once was a person who asked the Prophet, Ali Salam, what do you have to do to be a Muslim? The Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, well, first you have to bear witness that there's no God worthy of worship but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. And I said, okay, I got that. What else? <laughs> the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, well, you have to make the Salah five times a day, at night. And I said, is that all? The prophet said, well, yeah, unless you want to pray more than that. He said, well, what else do you have to do? He said, well, you have to pay the zakah, you know, two and a half percent tax on your earnings, on your savings, right, on your assets. And by the way, zakah is 2.5 percent, which, uh, you know, is $25 for every $1,000 worth of um, Assets. You know what I mean? I mean, that's really not a lot of money. $25 tax on every $1,000 worth of assets. That's all the law requires us to pay. But actually, the car is more than that if you're paying it with farm products. I think it's 10% or something like that. So, you know, like some people, they're farmers, and they would pay their zakah from their crop yield, in which case it's a little more than that. We're city-bound people, so we don't know about that kind of stuff, but I'm just mentioning it. And by the way, in the city here, when it comes time to pay your zakah, don't be coming up here with potatoes <laughs> and oranges and all of that type of stuff talking about I'm paying my zakah. And you ain't a farmer. You've been to the farmer's market. <laughs> and you laugh, but I, that's happened. <laughs> it's happened in the past. You know, I know my nephew Abdul Hakim came okay, with Yeah, you know, I told him, get that stuff out of here, put some money. <laughs> and that's who this human being. You know, people, people are funny, you know. And Gail, the other day, a brother took a shahada. I, I said, Brother, I'm going to give you some advice. Muslims are funny people. <laughs> okay. Okay. So these are the things we want to keep in mind with regards to the witch of prayer. So the Prophet, you know, he said, well, you have to pay the zakah. The man said, well, is that all? The Prophet said, well, yeah, unless you want to pay more than that. And he was meaning, he was talking about sadaqah. Zakah is compulsory. Sadaqah is voluntary. 
so I mentioned that hadith and it goes on, but I mentioned that going back to the part about the salah. The man said, if all you have to do is pray the five prayers, the prophet said, well, yes, unless you want to pray more than that. So the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he always prayed more than that. He would pray, the, you know, from Fajr through Salat al Isha. Then he would lay down, take a little nap. Then he would get up and he would pray the Tahajjud prayer. And then he would finish his Salatul Layl, his Qiyamul Layl. He would finish it by making a winter prayer consistent of one rakah. But also, as we hear from the other hadith, you can also make winter consistent of three rakah. So I'm pointing this out so that you'll be aware of what's going on if I'm leading the Salatul Harawi or Uthman or Harun or Ibrahim Sako. You know, sometimes you see us, we lead the Salah, we'll pray uh, four sets of two rakahs each, right? Then we'll say Salatul Winter, I usually say. I, I do it out loud purposely for instruction. I usually say Salatul Winter, Salatul Raka'at, Sunnah Rasulullah, the Day Ta'ala. You've heard me say that many times. You know, being Salatul Winter, I'm letting you know three rakahs, the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But then also, Sometimes any one of us, you might see us lead five sets of two rakahs each, like tonight. That's what I've done tonight. And now we're just going to pray one rakah with you. And I, you know, we do that purposely so that you'll understand there's more than one way to do this. And don't get locked. Don't get, you're going to get your mind frozen. And you think it's only one thing, and then you go to 96th Street or... 55th Street or somewhere, or Masjid al-Aqsa, you know what I mean? And somebody do something different and you're like, oh, who did that? I said, <laughs> you know, and people do that right. because of their limitation of knowledge. Then they'll say either one or two things. Either they'll say, ah, oh, man, the brothers here, they don't know how to make the prayer. <laughs> or, well, back in MIB, man, Imam Talib, he don't know how to make the prayer. He made a mistake. <laughs> Talk me wrong, man. I'm going to be a up, man. I'm serious. This is exactly what happened. No, what happens is you don't understand there's more than one way to make Kiyama Leo. Or more than one way of, of, of praying the witch. No thing, Bataj. You can also pray, you know, like we always, we generally follow, you know, Two tasling, two tasling, like that. You know, you could also pray four, then tasling, and then another four, and tasling. That's another way of making touch. Okay, so keep uh, increase your knowledge so that you can be flexible and maintain the peace, the peace of your prayer. You know, I was telling Captain Jawad the other day, he's talking about something. I was telling him something Sheikh Taufik used to say right now to our age, you were praying for general things. He used to say a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. Yeah. You know, somebody get a little tiny, you know, man, they're dangerous. I mean, you're around somebody and they say, well, all I know is this much. Okay, I'm gonna move away from them. <laughs> Because they're dangerous, you know. People get a little bit of knowledge and they think a, a, a puddle's worth of knowledge is the ocean. A puddle is not the ocean. And it's very, and these are usually the people who you see arguing and stuff of lying. And, you, know, you know, we was talking because somebody said, the stuff of the law. They told him, oh man, you shouldn't allow the kufar to come in the Musabah, right? <laughs> For oh, yeah, stuff a lot, you know what I mean? Because, you know, they might uh, uh, sully the world. You know, and I had to give them the job. And I said, man, that go all the way back 14 centuries ago. You know, you shouldn't allow women to come into the Musalla. Because they might sully. Listen, man, that's 1,400 years ago. When, uh, say, a woman might have her cycle. And they didn't have all sanitary napkins, excuse the expression, and all. So that would be a concern. If a, if a woman is on her missus, not all women. But if a woman is on a missus, say, well, you know, sis, stay, stay out of the sacred area. Because 
we don't want any accent, you know that type. Of thing. So somebody who don't know all that Dalio, they read something, they say, stop a lot, women shouldn't not allow it in the Musab. <laughs> the Kufar not allow it in the Musab. And I told him a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. You now people who have a little bit of knowledge, which is most of us, they should keep their mouth shut. <laughs> really, just listen. Keep your mouth shut, you know, because, and the more knowledge that people have, the more knowledge that people have, the less removed they are from the common person. I mean, these people who are really scholars, and, man, they're, they're knowledge based, man. It's like, it's like the difference between a, a lay person and uh, a PhD medical person. I was in the hospital the other day. I took my mother to the hospital. I passed by a bulletin board. They had an announcement for a lecture. Somebody reading the title of the lecture gave me a headache. <laughs> 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 yeah, somebody was getting ready to lecture, lecture on uh, expanding the synapse, the, the the pathways of synapse as. A, uh, a methodology for, you know, the treatment of Parkinson's <laughs> retroactive tool. I mean, that was the name of the uh, lecture. And now I imagine the guy who was giving the lecture and the people who was going to the lecture, all of that was, they was like, okay, yeah, come on, let's do this. But the average person, you know, it's like, <laughs> but it's the same thing with this here. There's people whose knowledge of this and whose knowledge of the Book of Allah is so way up there that before they even open their mouth to comment on something, they are referencing, just like in a computer, you know how you do a search, you go to a Google or whatever, you type in the word and all that stuff, where there's people who have knowledge of this, that when you ask them a question, that's what they do. They start accessing information. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This idea, that idea, this idea, that idea, this scholar's opinion. That, and they cross referencing stuff. You know, and you say, Dad, I wonder why it takes them so long. I just asked them some more questions. <laughs> and then they'll pick from all of that, they pick an answer for you or I. And then they'll say, You say, Well, is it yes or no? And they'll say, Well, it's yes and no. You understand what I'm saying? So that's it. That's all I have to say today. I'm trying to keep these dosses, uh short, shorter than I have in the past, you know, so we can pray and get out. And I'll you know, because also I was studying, uh, you know, Ibrahim uh, uh, and some of the other people who were leading the trial. You know, I was watching. I'm looking at the clock. I want to see how long does it take them to do what they have to do or make a dos. Now, you know, I, your imam, your know, imam gets invited to go to different masjids and give a dos. They ask, they call me, 50 50, imam, can you come and give a dos in between the witcher? How long do you want me to talk for? 15 minutes. I said, I said well, how long do you want me to talk? Five or 10 minutes? They said, no, 15. Or if I walk into, and most of the time you all are not with me, maybe sometime my wife might be with me. But most of the time, just one of the brothers is walk into 96th Street, and I'm just saying this because, you know, you need to know, you need to know. I walk into 96th Street, March be doing Tawi prayers, the Imam or the Sheikh, whoever's leading the prayer, they'd be like, oh, uh, Imam Talib is here. Oh, oh, no, Imam, you know, I always used to sit in the back. Yo, Imam, please don't come. Some of you've been there, you're my witness. I'm not making this up, and I'm not bragging. But I want you to understand because people are close to us and we don't understand. We take them for granted and other people don't. So you, you, you don't believe it? Come and go with me to 96th Street Monday night. And they're seeking the night of power. And we can walk in together and then watch them. They pull me down front. For what? To make commentary. And last year, I remember I finished my commentary after the Salah. A brother came up to me, you know, Arab. He said, they need for you to come here and give a dance. Say, because you say things, you know, because you know me, I'm going to 
make political statements and all. They say, man, if you say things that they ain't never going to say here. That's right. But that people need to hear. That's what my brother said that to me. Your mom, please keep coming. But I really go there very rarely. And now and then I pop in, I go in, you know. I went there one night during the beginning of Ramadan. Came, snuck in, prayed in the back. Prayer was over, I was getting my stuff to leave. And mom came running and said, oh, I didn't know you was here. I didn't know you was here. I said, yeah, I know. That's why I prayed in the back. <laughs> I was just coming trying to give bump a bump a couple of times and be out. <laughs> so I just say these things for our edification, brothers and sisters, you know, for our uh, spiritual enlightenment. And tonight is an even night. So we, we're going to be out. We're going to pray to one of our cards and we'll be out. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'll make the do it for Kulut and this one of our cards, which I haven't been making it. But usually I just follow the habit when it gets to the last uh, 10 days.